السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وفي جنة نعيم في الله All praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his family and his companions and all those who tread his path may Allah illuminate our minds and yours with his book and uh, purify our hearts with it and help us uh, be eased towards our path in this world a path that is pleasing to him uh, and to our homes in Jannah because of the rope he extended in that Quran. Allahumma ameen. So I am asked to discuss the first six or seven verses of Surat Al-Jum'ah uh, in tonight's webinar, which will be a bit of a challenge. Surat Al-Jum'ah is 11 verses, and uh, it is a Madani surah by agreement. came down in Medina, meaning after the Hijrah, the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the nature of surahs in general, I, I, I've said this before at these webinars, and should always be in the purview, front and center for any student of the Qur'an, is that the verses, the beginning and the end are all related. Uh, and finding those relationships, how they're related, uh, is the task uh, of the student and the reflector, the one pondering over the Qur'an. Because we said surah, the word surah to begin with, uh, comes from the word sur or same root as the word sur, which means a fence. And so Allah fenced together or bundled together a set of verses and separated them from another surah, another set of verses. So why are these separate from those? There is a reason, obviously. Uh, and so Surah Al-Jum'ah uh, speaks obviously about Jum'ah, which is the greatest day of the week. Uh, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about Jum'ah, about Friday, uh, that the greatest day the sun has ever risen upon is Jum'ah, is Friday. Uh, in it, Adam was created, السلام, and in it, he was admitted to paradise, and in it, he was removed from paradise. In some narrations, this uh, and in it, he was forgiven on in the Friday, in the day of Friday. And the hour will not be established except on the day of Jum'ah. So the day of Jum'ah is the day of reminder. Is the day where we remember our or, or our point of origination, our origin, and our final destination, uh, our our ultimate destiny, uh, and it is the day when we also remember what we're supposed to be doing between our origin and our destination, which is ibadah. That's why Jumu'ah is a day filled with ibadah, because ibadah is the practical way to remember. Establish prayer to remember from my remembrance. All of these ibadat are for are for it. Uh, and even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about Jumu'ah, I don't want to turn the whole lecture into the virtues of Jumu'ah, but it helps you understand why there's a whole surah on it. He said that uh, we are the last in terms of the chronology of human history. We are the last nation to come. He's the final prophet with the final ummah, but we'll be the first on the day of judgment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he explained, he said in the sense that we receive the book after them. They received it before us. Um, but we will be the first on the Day of Judgment. And he gives an, another example, not just about the book. He says that, uh, and this day, this day of Jumu'ah, it is in that hadith, is the day that Allah Azza wa guided this ummah to. Uh, to remembering the reality, remembering the mission, remembering the responsibility. He said, uh, Allah guided us to it. And... Uh, misled uh, them from it subhanahu wa ta'ala or turned them away from it in perfect justice of course we will we'll talk about that as well he said today is for us and tomorrow is for the jews saturday and the day after tomorrow is for the christians and so this is the day this is the big day that people misplace and so valuing jum'ah properly is really what the surah is about you're going to see at the beginning of the surah how people did not value revelation and disregarded it among the previous nations and how we will find at the end of the surah, whoever is discuss, discussing the end of the surah, a reprimand and a disciplining of the model generation, the generation of the Sahaba, uh, teaching them to take khutbat al-Jum'ah, the reminder at Jum'ah, extremely seriously, abandoning trade, abandoning everything else. Okay, so that was the five-minute intro, which only gives me 15 minutes left to discuss some of the terms of the surah. The surah begins by saying, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ that you said bihullah, praising Allah, exalting Allah, glorifying Allah is everything in the heavens and in the earth. Meaning everything in the universe is busied, preoccupied all the time with 
glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't ever forget to glorify him, uh, except for the human being, obviously, by virtue of his will, by virtue of Allah giving him a choice, by Allah giving him some sort of agency. He's the exception. Sometimes he forgets, does not remind himself to glorify Allah. Uh, and so glorifying Allah is everything in the heavens and in the earth. Uh, Al-Malik Al-Quddus Al-Aziz Al-Hakim Okay These are four names of Allah Azza wa Jal That appear twice in the Quran like this uh, In this sequence And uh, all together Here in Surah Al-Jum'ah And also in Surah Al-Hashr That could be discussed at a later time But what do these names mean? Al-Malik means the king The, the one that has mulk uh, Mulk means sovereignty Sovereignty is a big word Mulk means control, the one who is in control. Uh, he never lost control, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is not just Al Malik, uh, which is one of the names of Malik, but he is also the Malik. Because you can own something, but you don't really have control over it. Or you can be given control of something, but not forever because you don't own it. But Allah is Al Malik and Al Malik. And that's why in Surah Al Fatiha you say Malik and Malik interchangeably between two different qiraat these are both traceable to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in any case so al malik is the one that's in control the sovereign the authority uh, so he didn't create his creation and divorce it he remains in control of his creation al quddus al quddus means yes the sanctified the pure the one that has no flaws quddus literally means the flawless the flawless the pure al aziz is the mighty Mighty means the one that bears great might and also the one that confers might, gives izzah to whomever he wishes, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And al-hakim, al-hakim, the most wise, means the one who places everything in its proper place and also confers wisdom, places wisdom wherever he wishes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, inspires the meaning with wisdom whoever he wishes so he is hakim meaning in everything he does and everything he gives that's what hikmah is to place things in their proper place uh so in terms of the universe he's wise in all of his determinations and in terms of the sharia that he revealed everything is perfectly placed in his perfect system of laws that he asked us to live by and he is al hakim the, also the one who only places guidance to that system those deserving of it so those four names are important to understand because they are very related to the following verses or the rest of the surah. They're the introduction of the surah because Allah Azza wa Jal speaking here will be speaking in light of him being Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim in particular. And we'll just give one example just in the interest of time which is this next ayah when Allah Azza wa Jal says ba'atha He is the one who sent among the ummiyin, the unlettered or the illiterate, a messenger. Meaning Allah is al-Malik, al-Quddus, al-Aziz, al-Hakim, the all-powerful, the fully in control, the one who is not blemished by imperfection or does things that are unwise. No, he stays caring for his creation, did not neglect them. He sent them a messenger uh, um, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the unlettered people, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who sent, now let's get to that verse in particular, what we can learn from it. He is the one who sent among the Ummiyin. The Ummiyin mean the illiterates. So the Prophet ﷺ is known in the Quran and elsewhere as a Nabi al Ummi, the Prophet, the unlettered Prophet. Uh, and some say the word Ummi comes from the word Umm. Umm is what? Mother. And so Ummi is the people that are uneducated in a sense, right, in terms of literacy. So meaning they are as. Is blank, as a blank sheet as their mother gave birth to them. That's what he, according to some uh, linguists or etymologists. So he is the one who sent among the Ummiyin because in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he uh, was surrounded by people and he was also a person that could not read or write. Even if some of them could have read or wrote, in general they were an Ummi people. By and large, they were people that, Ill that were illiterate. And so Allah sent among them. A messenger from them uh, or sent from them a messenger from among them yet alayhim ayatihi who has four tasks he recites to them his verses the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and he purifies them the word taskiyah means purification it means development as well 
So he doesn't just purify them from the evil qualities. He develops in them the good qualities. Uh, and and he teaches them the kitab and the hikmah, the book and the wisdom. Um, this, of course, is a response to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam who asked Allah to send these people a messenger. Allah azza wa jal uh, sent the world, right? He, he sent among the ummiyin a messenger, but that messenger, of course, was for the whole world. We sent it to all of humanity. Uh, and so Allah responded to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam by sending these unlettered people, a prophet who is unlettered like them. Uh, and, and look at, go back to Allah's names now, Al-Malik Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, that Allah taught the world literacy, taught the world to think, to open their eyes, to open their hearts, to open their minds at the hands of a man alayhi salatu wasalam, who was himself unlettered. That is part of the miraculous nature of this message that filled the world with light. He is the one who sent among the Ummiyin, the unlettered, a messenger, Yatslu alayhim ayatihi, uh, who set, recites them his verses and purifies them and teaches them the book and the wisdom. And of course, if you're not purified, then learning the book and the wisdom. By the way, the book here, I'm sorry, the book here is not just the Quran. For sure, that's the highest form of literacy. Sacred knowledge is superior to secular or profane knowledge. But kitab here could also mean the, 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 the concept of written knowledge because the, our deen even came to teach us that we must write certain things down and taught us to learn in general, you know. Uh, and so literacy in general is what he's teaching the world. And the highest literacy is sacred literacy, learning sacred knowledge. That's for sure a part of it. But we don't have to res restrict the word hikmah here to that. Uh, kitab here to that. Likewise, the, teach them hikmah. Hikmah means wisdom for you to be inspired by Allah uh, to do things right on a detailed level. Like you have that in the Quran and Sunnah, but how do you actually uh, apply that, uh, bring that down to the personal level, the individual level, to customize that for your life? That is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For sure, the deen gives you the fundamentals of hikmah. That's why, and the hikmah here, of course, many of the scholars say is the sunnah, because the sunnah is the application of the Qur'an, so you don't misapply the Qur'an. But even the sunnah itself, how do you not misapply the sunnah? How do you, uh, how do you not selectively read the sunnah? How do you not use it out of context? That is why it began by saying, reciting the verses, where you zakki him and purify them first. Okay, if you don't purify your heart first, then your mind will be held against you. What you understand from any book, even the Quran, from the Sunnah, even the Sunnah, it won't matter because you will read it how you want to read it. Instead of serving, understanding correctly, you'll understand what you want to understand. In any case, Allah sent this messenger among them to recite to them the book and the wisdom and purify them and uh, teach them the book and the wisdom. And uh, although, they, although they were before it in dalal, error, misguidance, loss, uh, mubin, clear, loss that is clear, clear loss or clear error. And so it was also from the hikmah of Allah that he sent among the ummiyin a messenger because sending it to the most primitive people in terms of literacy shows the transition, the most obvious transition to the greatest nation of humanity, shepherds of sheep, to the leaders of civilizations like uh, and they were also the most fit by the way it's not just about them being the biggest transition the the other civilizations would have had less of a transition intellectually because they had philosophies they had sciences and otherwise so someone could have said he's building off of aristotle he's building off of one of the the uh, the, the, the leaders of chinese thought or indian thought these were major empires the arabs were not so it was intellectual transition it was miraculous but also of his wisdom as he sent them among the Arabs uh, because the Arabs were superior in certain regards. The same way they were inferior in this regard, the intellectual, they were also superior. They were not, uh, what's the word? Uh, diminished, uh, devolved by the, the, the flaws of luxury, right? They were a people that were very truthful. They were people that were very uh, durable. Um, riches and uh, luxuries of the major civilizations had not tainted them, so they were the ideal. It was perfect hikmah that he chose the Arab 
to be the original recipients of this message. Number one, because they could handle it, those of them that were that would be purified by the recitation of these verses due to their nature, their purity and these and their durability, something that is very hard to be taught. And at the other end, because they had no other cultural baggage to hold them back or to or to cause the world to doubt that they were coming with something truly unique, something out of nowhere in the middle of the desert. And they were before that in clear error. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And to others, he was also sent to others uh, who have not yet joined them, who have not yet joined these people that were in clear error, but they received the message, were purified by it, and learned the book and the wisdom. This is, subhanAllah, uh, of, of a foretelling who are not the original recipients, not Quraysh, not Quraysh uh, and Aus and Khazraj, not just the Arabian Peninsula, who would uh, be given this message and become of the greats of this ummah, of the bearers of these torches of guidance to the world that was in utter darkness without it. Allah said this would, in fact, uh, happen. People would catch up with them um no matter how far they're coming from no matter how late they were you know subhanallah some people mention uh that this is referring to the people of persia for example and this is very possible because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh and he put his hand on salman al-farisi salman the persian that uh if uh, faith were at the stars people from this man's regions would still go get it and this is amazing because if you think of some of the greatest leaders of the muslim ummah early on think of the six books of hadith even the six books of hadith were collected for us the sunnah of the prophet ﷺ was preserved for us by men these men if you look at their names their names come from lands that are not arab lands and they're not subhanallah like bukhari from bukhara uzbekistan uh, muslim was arab but if you dig back further naysabur from naysabur Khurasan, Sijistani, uh, Nasai. Uh, it's very interesting, right? Uh, these were, they were five out of six, if not six out of six of the major books were Persians or from the lands of Persia. In any case, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ Right there to the next verse. That is the bounty of Allah. He granted to whomever he wishes. وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ And Allah is possessor of great bounty. That is the bounty of Allah. Uh that he grants to whomever he wishes that that he sent his guidance meaning to a man that is the bounty of allah prophethood nobody can ever attain that it is not earnable it was a gift and also fadlullah that people embrace this message hear about it and embrace the message that allah delivers it to those who he knows there is good in their hearts uh والله and allah is the possessor of great bounty subhanahu wa ta'ala then he mentions those who received an indirect or a direct warning those who received the books before, and he said, The example of those who were entrusted with the Torah, the book that was given to Musa, then did not take it on. They were given it, so they didn't embrace it. They were made to take it, they were commissioned with it, and but they did not live up to that. They did not carry it, meaning they did not carry it the way it should be carried. They did not live up to it. It's like the example, those people, that did that, those guilty of that crime for squandering Allah's book is like the example of a donkey who carries volumes, who carries a library. You know, subhanAllah, they say, uh, you know, a donkey is representative of uh, the unintelligent, right? And also the, do the donkey is representative of one of the most submissive animals, right? A donkey is not like a horse or a camel. Uh, a, a, a child can grab the rope and direct a donkey and find no resistance. Uh, and so they rejected the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal, and so they were left to their own vices. They were not guided, and so anyone was able to manipulate them. Anyone was able to uh, sway them into the darkest, uh, the darkest paths. The example of those that were given the Torah and they did not carry it. They did not give due respect to the messenger and the revelation he came with, what he recited to them. It's like the example of a donkey carrying a library. 
the Anki is weighed down by this, right? That's one of the reasons why, perhaps. And also because they were not increased in intelligence by this. That's another reason. And the third is that this donkey can be so easily manipulated uh, by virtue of them uh, stripping themselves of eligibility of Allah's guidance. If Allah does not guide you, you cannot fend for yourself. And so then Allah Azza wa Jal challenges them here and he says, and this is also of the honoring he gave to the Prophet Sallallahu that he's authorizing him here to speak, right? No one is going to say, don't talk to us. We are the, the chosen people of God. We, we carry God's book. We, this was the, they, they took the book on for bragging rights, not for uh, genuine devotion. So he's telling him, say. That word say here tells you a lot. Tells you the Prophet Sallallahu is speaking from a place of authority. God is saying, I am telling you, tell them. I said, say, you're speaking on my behalf. Say, O oh, you, Alavina Hadu. Say, O oh, you who have Hadu. Hadu is like Yahud, Jews, or Hadu comes from the word uh, like Hidayah, guidance, because they say we Hadu, we came back, we repented. Uh, that is what they said, Alavina Hadu. Other places in the Quran use as well like this, but in effect, it's speaking about the the, the tribes of the Jews. Say, O oh, you uh, Jews who are Jews or have ascribe themselves to, to Judaism. If you claim that you are the allies of Allah, excluding the people of the other, uh, excluding the other people, then wish for death if you should be truthful. Uh, but they will never wish for it because of what their hands put forth. And as Allah is, the, Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. So Allah is saying, I know they are wrongdoers. And they know deep down inside they are not uh, wrongdoers, which is why they are not my chosen people. Because, you know, the other ayah says what? That Ibrahim alayhi said, what about my offspring, O Allah? He said, لا ينال عهد الظالمين. My covenant does not cover the zalimin. So Allah here says, Wallahu alimun bil-zalimin. Allah knows full well who are the zalimin, who are the transgressors, who are uh, the aggressors. I'll stop here. Uh, this is all speaking about, uh, once again, the, the ni'mah of being able to connect with Allah and remember him, like, like the whole universe remembers him, and the uh, catastrophe of the previous nations fumbling that ni'mah and fumbling that duty uh, among humanity, and then it will move on to cautioning uh, the believers from uh, fumbling that in light, uh, in terms of Salatul Jumu'ah in particular, because the day of Jumu'ah is the day of remembrance. I hope I kind of pulled it all together for everyone. Subhanakallah, alhamdulik, shadu alayhi wa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Maybe we can open the floor for questions now. Um, so inshallah, the first question, um, we talked a little bit about the, the Jewish people and their relationship with their book. What lessons can we learn from the mistakes of previous nations in terms of how they approach their book and how can we have a better relationship with the Quran and our book through reflecting on some of those lessons. Okay, so Bismillah, it's a difficult question to answer succinctly, but we see in the Quran some specific examples of what went wrong between them and their book um number one they uh neglected acting upon it right they neglected acting upon it and so when they neglected acting upon it uh they began misunderstanding it so allah azza wa jal says in surah al-saf which is actually the very next surah in the quran uh, once they deviated Allah caused their hearts to deviate and this is something that we need to all understand that you will act on what you believe is right in this context the Quran or else you will believe that what you're doing is right that's just human nature you will act on what you're doing is right or you will start believing that what you're already doing is what's right in other words, you will pull yourself together to change for the better or else you will silence your guilt after a while, silence your conscience after a while and tell yourself, I don't need to change. This is what is correct. And so selectively reading the Quran is something we see nowadays, certainly. 
a distorted understanding. We're never going to fall into what Banu Israel did of distorting the words of the Quran. Uh, but we can't because Allah has promised to protect this book as opposed to the previous nations. Not that he couldn't protect the book. That's an important fact. People always say, you, you guys, you Muslims say we can't, God couldn't protect this book. We're not saying God couldn't. We're saying God chose to entrust people with protecting the book. And they kept failing that trust. Uh, with when it comes to this last prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said this is the last book. No one's entrusted with protecting it. You're obligated to protect it, but it's ultimately going to be protected whether you try or not. You're just either going to be guilty for not trying or uh, dignified and honored for for serving that cause. Anyway, so you're not going to distort the, the words of the Quran, but distorting the meanings of the Quran is is something. Uh, we see all around us, right? Don't we try to explain away, dismiss uh, certain concepts of the Quran that are not aligned with the trending modern culture? Absolutely. And so if we try to do that, if we try to do that, we will be able to do that. Be able to, meaning what? Meaning in our eyes, we'll think we found in the Quran reasons to not follow the intended meaning of the Quran. Uh, and so we should be very afraid of that. We should be very afraid of Allah Azza wa Jal allowing us to believe our own uh, dishonesty and turning our hearts off from the reality of what he's saying to us. And that is why Al-Hasan or Qatada, rahimahullah, the great Tabi'i student of Anas ibn Malik, he says that nobody stands up from the Quran, meaning from a moment of sitting down with the Quran, except that he will either improve or he will become worse. Uh, he said, because Allah said this in the Quran, he said, We send down this Quran in a way that, that offers, that brings mercy and cure to the believers, and it only increases the wrongdoer in loss. The more he reads, the more astray he goes. And so the Quran is very much about the receptacle with which you come to this blessed book the container with which you present it. If it's a contaminated container, it will contaminate the purest water that is spilled inside of it. And so the purest words of Allah, if it's going back to the second ayah or third ayah, if it's not use the him first, then teaching the book and the wisdom, it is a uh, a dangerous path from there, a very dark and ugly path from there. So studying the Quran as it is, for, being sincere in studying the Quran is a very important part. But before that, you need to act on a bit of what you know. For sure, you, there'll always be a gap between what you know and what you do because it's easier to learn than to act. But for you not to totally be ne negligent of what you're learning. When you learn something, say, okay, how can I act on some of this? How can I act on this at least once before I forget it? How can I? This type of respect for the Quran, not just taking it for granted, not just thinking of it as an intellectual luxury, is a huge part of that. We should not assume that we have control of our hearts. May Allah protect our hearts and, and yours from, from misunderstanding his messages. Jazakallah khair. We discussed the topic of death and how the Jewish people were challenged with wishing for death. What should be our relationship with the um, concept of death? You know, death is something that some people fear. We are supposed not to fear death. Um, how should our attitude to, to death really be? And what That's can we great. learn from the, the Jewish people uh, that we don't make the same mistake? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, not just some people fear death, like everyone's supposed to fear death in some sense. Even Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said this, right? She said, there's a hadith in. Uh, in, in Bukhari and Muslim, where Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whomever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves meeting them, and whoever hates meeting Allah, Allah hates meeting them. She said, Ya Rasulullah, we all hate to die. Like, it's just human nature. Who, who, who loves to die? Who loves to, to go inside of a box, go inside of the ground, enter into the unknown? Uh, <clears throat> and so he said to her, Laysa dhaak, ya Aisha. This, this, he's not, uh, this is not what I'm speaking about. He said, rather, I'm talking about when the angel comes to a person at death and gives them the glad tidings at that point. And Allah loves meeting those people. And the person at death who sees the angel like comes to them with the awful news of what awaits them. Uh, and so they hate meeting Allah, and so Allah hates meeting them. 
And so it is completely natural uh, to hate death, to be afraid of death, uh, to be severed from from your world, uh, especially when you, when you don't, even as a believer, you don't know what awaits you in the next world, right? Uh, we are not, we are hopeful, we are not certain. We are hopeful, we are not certain. Uh, and so that is perfectly natural. The idea here is that death is extremely liberating and it should always be remembered so far as it is liberating. Liberating from what? That the things that we consider are huge in our life, like our problems, our ambitions about life, it liberates us from that lie. It's not that big. It's actually much smaller than that. It helps you calibrate. It liberates you from that overinflation. And likewise, those things that are so huge, like our salah, like our iman, which seem to be all we can really notice is a little bit of their importance. It liberates you from that tiny box and it, it lets you know exactly how what their actual size is in the... In reality of things. So it liberates you from, a, from an, uh, the fake reality. It for yourself. It always be remembered so long as it is productive in that nature. Death should not be remembered when it will. Like there's no point in trying because we're all going to die anyway. This is not this is not the type of morbid uh, hopelessness that Islam calls for at all. Uh, Islam calls for the very opposite. It calls you to not be held back by anything in this world, including your departure from this world. That's what Islam calls for. That's basically it. And so. If you are caught off guard by death, you know, from this world, you're severed from this world by death, that thought should get you to prepare for death really well. It is, it is moving, it is motivated, right? It should also uh, get you to, to not worry too much because you are being handed off to Allah Azza wa Jal, from Allah Azza wa Jal. He's still in control of my life and my afterlife. Death is good for me. Grant me death. If death is bad for me, uh, give me more life. That's the idea. You don't really know. And so you're, it helps you, number one, prepare, and number two, trust. The Islamic perspective on death helps you do that. And this is all found where? In the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen uh, uh, and your... Uh, Ability over your creation grant me life so long as life is good for me and put me to death whenever you know that death is better for me That's a very beautiful perspective in terms of more life could be more problems more life could be more hurts more life could be more sins uh, at the same time more life could be more good deeds and higher levels and uh, better company in Jannah Wallahu ta'ala alam Jazakallah khair um, during the time of revelation of these verses um, in Medina, um, during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did any of the Jewish people accept Islam uh, in response to these verses? And if so, um, are there any inspirational stories for us from any of the Sahaba that converted from Judaism? Yeah, certainly. Abdullah ibn Salam was the, of the very first people. He was the first rabbi to become Muslim. Abdullah ibn Salam was in Medina. Abdullah ibn Salam said when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first came to Medina as he was riding in, I heard him say, O oh people, uh, salam, spread peace, like spread security among people. And food, feed one another, feed people food. And pray at night while people are asleep. You will enter paradise safely and securely. Uh, he said, and I looked in his face. And I uh, looked in his face and I knew that this was not the face of a liar. Uh, and so ultimately, Abdullah went to the Prophet والسلام, and confirmed that he was a prophet and he embraced Islam and he said to him, uh, do not tell my people I became Muslim because my people are a people of buht. Uh, buht means slander. Uh, they make up lies and they spread them about people. And so the Prophet uh, came to an agreement with Ibn Salam on how he would break the news to the rest of the Jews. 
And so he invited the, some of their senior scholars over and Ibn Salam was hiding behind a, a curtain or a wall. And he said to them, what do you say about Abdullah Ibn Salam? And they said, he is uh, our leader and the son of our leader and he is our scholar and the son of our scholar. He's the most knowledgeable of us, the son of the most knowledgeable of us. Uh, he said, and what would you say if he became Muslim? They said, A'udhu Billah, he would never do something like this. He would never follow your fake religion. Uh, so Abdullah bin Salam at that point came out uh, and said, I do testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and none is worthy of worship but Allah. And so they said, you are the most evil of us, son of the most evil of us. You are the most ignorant of us, the son of the most ignorant of us. Uh, and they went about spreading their lies. When, when the Jews of Medina kept asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi certain questions to verify his prophethood, uh, and he kept answering correctly, and sometimes not answering, and him answering would have disp that would have been held against him because they asked him certain questions that no one is, is, is supposed to know but a prophet, and there are certain questions that no one is supposed to know, period. And he passed all of those tests, and so the best of them who didn't become Muslim testified that he was a prophet, but they... Uh, once again, they understood what they wanted to understand. They, okay, you are a prophet, but a prophet to the Ummiyin, a prophet to the unlettered people. You're not a prophet to us. I mean, you don't apply to us because you're not from Benu Israel. And so some of them rejected his prophethood altogether. Some of them accepted he was a prophet, but they refused to embrace him as their prophet, which is a selective reading of the Quran because the Quran that called him a prophet to the Ummi, to the Ummiyin also said he is a prophet to all of humanity. Uh, meaning he's a prophet to humanity through the Ummiyin. In any case, that's the second category. The third category are people like Abdullah ibn Salam who did embrace his message uh, and Ka'b al-Ahbar and many others who we can talk about at a later time, inshallah. Jazakallah, Karen. Uh, it's a question from a participant. Um, they heard you use the term Ahl sunnah wal Jama. Can you explain what this term means and uh, is it a term only uh, in the Sunnis? I didn't use that term today. So, someone is doing some investigative journalism about me. <laughs> I didn't use that term today, but I have no problem explaining it. This term yeah, is attributed to uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma. Um, he said when the basically the phenomenon of the Khawarij came out, the Khawarij were the rebels that called uh, that called Ali ibn Abi Talib kafir, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu said about the Khawarij that they are Kilabu Ahlin Nar, the dogs of the hellfire. In any case, uh, this was the first bid'ah and many other bid'ah uh, arose, uh, like innovation, innovated, unprecedented beliefs. And so people began becoming cultish. Like every time someone thinks of a belief that has no precedence, not traceable all the way back to the Sunnah, it is their own brainchild they would start like hovering around it. Like the pe like-minded people would become a cult based on a certain ideology, to use modern terms. And so Ibn Abbas said, when these things started becoming apparent, we had to identify ourselves. So the way we identify ourselves is saying, we are Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which means we are the people of the Sunnah, meaning we require that every belief that we have is traceable all the way back to the Sunnah, not the one personality or another who, who developed it supposedly out of, his mind or the Quran or the Sunnah or the or or a Persian or a Greek understanding of a verse, selective reading, a verse of the Quran and Sunnah, stuff like that. He said, We are people of the Sunnah, well jama'a and the community, meaning the the unity, we didn't get divided based on these things, and we did not break off from what the original community, the Muslim community, uh believed. That's how they so sometimes it's just called Ahl Sunnah, the people of the Sunnah. And by people of the Sunnah, what they mean is the the belief system in the time of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. They don't mean Sunnah in the sense that we use sometimes within Sunni Muslims, within fiqh discussions, that it's a recommended act, part of the perfect example of the Prophet ﷺ, not mandatory. No, no, no. When people are talking about aqidah, talking about theology, and they use the word Sunnah, they mean the belief system that is traceable all the way back to the Prophet وسلم, did not arise later on. So when it arised later on, it caused disunity 
every person runs off with their own infection. And so how do we identify the original? Ibn Abbas said, we, some of us started using the term Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. Doesn't mean you have to use this term. It doesn't mean everyone who uses this term actually means by it what Ibn Abbas said. And it also doesn't mean that everyone who uses this term and means what Ibn Abbas said actually knows what Ibn Abbas and the rest of the Sahaba were upon. It's a term. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes you need to clarify further if it becomes vague in a certain time or place. Could be hijacked. Jazakallah, Karen. Uh, there's a question here. I heard some excerpts are taken from the Torah and are in the Quran. Is it true? Okay. So uh, I'm not sure what the questioner means by it because it, it could be understood two different ways. But let me try to quickly answer both. If it is meant that the Prophet ﷺ plagiarized from the Torah, uh, uh, there is nothing sillier uh, that the critics of Islam try to say than that. Because even the Quran, by the way, the Quran says this. They say, The tongue, meaning the language that they attribute him to, they say that he took from somewhere else. Well, that somewhere else was said in a different language. And this is a clear Arabic Quran. Meaning, let's say, for example, even though there's ways to disprove the Prophet did not take from them other ways. But let's just assume, for argument's sake, he took from them. He plagiarized from them. Uh, their book was not Arabic. And so how do you account for the masterpiece, the linguistic, literary masterpiece of the Quran? Right? Uh, and even if it were in Arabic, the Torah, there are other proofs that the Quran does not match the Torah. There are many uh, places of divergence between the Quran and the Torah that, by the way, historically have been proven to be aligned, like the, the historical reality is aligned with the Quran, not the Torah. The Torah was mistaken many a times historically. Uh, the Bible has been, many facts in the Bible have been disproven historically uh, through carbon dating and otherwise. None of those, the Quran, uh, copied. <laughs> if the Quran copied, how come it didn't copy those parts? Because the Quran came from Allah, not from the Torah. The, the story version of the Torah. That's the first uh, way to understand this question, that it was plagiarism. The second way is that Allah Azza wa actually repeated words that were in the Torah, uh, in the Quran, and this is not really true. Um, maybe concepts, like the concept of the Ten Commandments. Uh, this is what some scholars consider Ayat al-Surat al-An'am, a, a re- uh, capturing of the Ten Commandments, the, the Sacred Commandments. Also, uh, there are narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari from uh, from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's description in the Qur'an was like his description in the Torah. Uh, and then he recited his description in the Torah. There was some matching of words, of phrases, but it's not identical. It is not identical. And he mentions the ayat in Surah Al-Ahzab. To the end of it, then he speaks about the difference where it doesn't continue the way the surah continues. I hope that answers the question. Allah.